Today I'm answering six of the most common questions I get about ovulation. From how long does it take to why is it painful for some people and information on the fertile window, we're answering it all in this video. Thank you to the channel Membrios for providing most of the questions in this and other Q&A videos on the channel. And thank you to Anito for sponsoring this video. We'll hear more about them in a minute. How long does the process of ovulation actually take? The actual act of ovulation is somewhat instant, but the process of creating and growing a follicle with an oocyte inside and getting it to the point that it's ready to be ovulated takes a couple of weeks, 12 to 14 days. Now, oogenesis or the creation of an oocyte and the process of getting it to the point where it's even ready to become a mature oocyte can take quite a bit longer. But for the purposes of this video and this question, I think, the answer would be the process of ovulation is fairly instantaneous. I think this Nucleus Media video is a really great example of the process of ovulation, so we can watch it together. I'll put a little clip here and I'll link the original video down below as well. So you can see that the follicle gets a little bit bigger. It bursts open. The oocyte exits along with a small amount of fluid and over the course of just a couple of seconds to a few minutes, the oocyte is released and hopefully picked up by the end of the fallopian tube, which is no, not attached to the ovary. This is something that I think has been blowing people's mind on the internet lately. The ovary and the end of the fallopian tube called the fembria do not attach to each other. It is a chemical attraction that brings the fembria of the tube closer to the oocyte once it is ovulated. It's a very interesting process and I think that most people have had their minds blown when they found this out. So there you go. Our bodies are amazing. Are you really born with all the eggs that you'll ever have? Conventionally, we have thought that this was the case, that around 20 weeks gestation, you had maybe seven or eight million eggs in your ovaries. And by birth, that number had dropped to about one to two million per ovary. And by puberty, that number had dropped to about 75,000 per ovary. But there is some newer data coming out, which does a fairly good job of challenging this historical belief that we've had in science by showing that the ovaries actually contain stem cells called oocyte stem cells, which are capable of generating new oocytes. So I think the answer to this question at this point is we don't know. And the reason that I included it is because I think it's a really good example of how we have to be fluid because science and technology, what we can learn and identify changes over time. And we have to be willing to unlearn things that we used to think were absolutely true. So we don't know for sure and we're working on learning it and it's really exciting. The data is really interesting and hopefully in the next few years, we'll know more information about that. How do I know when I'm ovulating? There's a few ways to do this. The most common way would be just tracking your cycles using a calendar. Now, this is a little bit more accurate for people who have fairly regular cycles, because if your cycles are regular, then you know you're ovulating around 14 days before your next period is due to begin. But obviously, if you're trying to get pregnant, that's not super helpful because your cycles can change a little bit and it only kind of confirms your fertile window after it's already passed. You can add to that basal body temperature charting, which is a really interesting thing, I did this when I was trying to get pregnant with my first pregnancy. You chart your temperature each morning and it confirms ovulation because that progesterone increase that we've talked about before that happens after ovulation causes a slight increase in your core body temperature. And you can confirm that ovulation happened by charting that on a cycle chart. The problem or the downside with this is that again, you're still only confirming ovulation in hindsight. It doesn't really help predict your fertile window if you're trying to get pregnant. It is an interesting thing to do and I think really useful. It requires a special thermometer and you have lots of parameters around like when to take your temperature and all of that. I'll link some information down below if you wanna learn more about it. Honestly, it'd probably make a really great video on its own. If you want to add something to your cycle tracking that maybe helps you identify your fertile window before it has already closed, adding cervical mucus tracking can be really helpful as well. As you move closer to ovulation, the cervical mucus should get more thin and clear and like a egg white consistency. I'll link an information sheet or a website about cervical mucus tracking down below as well, but that can be a useful addition if you're just trying to chart your cycles and predict your fertile window. There's even newer technology though, which can help you identify your fertile window while it's happening, which obviously you would need to do if you're trying to get pregnant and confirm that ovulation has occurred using test strips that test your hormone levels. And that brings us to the wonderful sponsor of today's video, 
Anito. Anito is a fertility monitor that allows you to track four hormones related to your fertility using a single test strip from the comfort of your own home. When they reached out, I told them that of course I would have to look into the data on their product and try it out for myself before discussing it here. When I tell you that my little reproductive nerd brain is obsessed, I am not kidding. The device comes fitted for your smartphone and the strips are read using the camera and then it goes into their app and gives you readouts of actual levels to help predict your fertile window and confirm ovulation after it happens. I'm happy to share some of my own charts with you just because I find it very interesting. So certain days it will say low fertility, which means that you're not in your fertile window. Other days it will say high fertility, which means that the estrogen levels have started to increase above baseline and you are likely moving towards ovulation at some point it will say peak fertility which indicates a spike in the LH indicating that you likely have ovulated or will ovulate soon and then at some point it will say ovulation confirmed after it's said progesterone is rising and that means it has noted an increase in the progesterone metabolite in your urine and now they've been able to confirm that you ovulated based on those levels. Unlike traditional ovulation tests which just tell you yes or no, Anito actually gives you numerical results for four different hormones which helps you to more closely and accurately track your cycle over time. I'm not trying to conceive but I enjoy using the app just because it's very interesting to track my cycles with it but this would be an incredibly useful tool tool for anyone who is trying to get pregnant. If you'd like to try out Anito and support my channel in the process, MDJ viewers can get a 15% discount by using my link in the description box down below. Now, let's get back to the video. Why is ovulation painful for some people and not for others? As you could see from the video that we watched earlier, as the oocyte exits from the follicle, there is a small amount of fluid and sometimes even a small amount of blood that's released around that and gathers in the pelvis. This is usually a very, very tiny amount, and in some people, they don't even notice it. But like we have talked about in a couple of other videos, the lining of the inside of the abdomen and your intestines and your organs and things like that is very sensitive to anything being around it that's not supposed to be there. It doesn't like fluid touching the outside or hands touching it. It just doesn't like foreign substances being around. So even a small amount of fluid or blood can be really irritating and kind of lead to that kind of crampy bloating feeling that some people get around the time of ovulation. Why it happens in some people and not others is a little bit hard to say. It could be that more fluid is released just naturally in some people or that their organs are just a little bit more sensitive. It could be that they are just paying closer attention and they happen to notice it. Or it could be that you just are a little bit more susceptible to those symptoms. It's hard to say. It can happen in some cycles and not others as well, which likely is related to how much blood or fluid ends up being released along with the egg and how irritating that is to the inside of the abdomen. This has a word for it. It's called Mittelschmerz. It's a German word and it means middle pain, like middle of the body or middle of the cycle, a bit debatable, but middle pain is what this is called. Importantly, ovulation should never be terribly painful or horribly awful. So if you're having severe pain, I wouldn't chalk that up to ovulation pain. Ovulation pain typically is a short-lived kind of crampy, bloaty discomfort, maybe with a little bit of actual pain for a short period of time, but it should never be more severe than that. Can you ovulate without having a menstrual cycle or have a menstrual cycle without ovulating? The easy answer to this is no, you can't. But like all things on this channel and in science and medicine in general, there is a little bit more of a nuanced answer that we can go through. So technically, you will ovulate one time before you have menses. So before your first menstrual cycle, you'll ovulate at least one time. And if you are not having cycles because you were pregnant or breastfeeding or on some kind of medication that made you not ovulate, you will ovulate one time before you have a menstrual cycle or menses. So technically, yes, you can ovulate without having a menstrual cycle if you ovulated and got pregnant in that one time frame where you ovulate before you've gone back to having menses or started menses in general. The only way that happens though, again, is if you get pregnant in that one time frame. The opposite as far as can you have a menstrual cycle and not be ovulating 
is a little more complex of an answer because technically it wouldn't be menses, I suppose, but yes, you can have what we call anovulatory bleeding. Typically this presents in people who have things like PCOS or thyroid disorders, which are affecting their menstrual cycle. And they usually will have really irregular bleeding. Sometimes that can go on for a prolonged period of time, two or three months. It can be just spotting or really heavy, but it doesn't typically take on a predictable cycle. It tends to be very irregular, both in how it presents and how heavy it is. The other part of that is that it's not usually accompanied by what we call melimina symptoms, which are kind of what you would think of as like PMS type symptoms. So you usually don't get like the breast tenderness or the bloating or the mood changes, things that you see generally with a menstrual cycle that happen because of those hormonal shifts, because without ovulation, you're not seeing those big shifts in the hormones. The other way that you can have a menstrual cycle without having ovulated would be something called a progestin withdrawal bleed. The progestin is elevated after ovulation. We talked about that in the menstrual cycle video. We talked about that when we were talking about a need to fertility monitor earlier, and we'll talk about it again many times in the future, I'm sure, that progesterone increases after ovulation, and then the day before you start your menstrual cycle, it drops drastically because the corpus luteum cyst dies off and the progesterone production goes away. You can mimic that with synthetic progestins, like a progestin-only pill or something, and we sometimes do that clinically to assess why somebody might not be having cycles. I won't get into all of it, it's a bit in depth, but I can give somebody 10 days of progestin hormonal medication, and when they stop it, generally we would expect them to have a menstrual cycle or a withdrawal bleed. You will also see this when you're taking a cyclic birth control pill. When you get to the sugar pills or the placebo pills or the days where you skip taking anything, your progesterone levels drop because you stop taking that progestin medication orally, and then your period starts when you go on to the placebo pills. Does that make sense? So yes, technically these are not the same thing, but there is some nuance to the answer of this question. Thanks for being here today, y'all. I hope that you learned something. Thank you to the channel Membrios for providing the questions in this Q&A. If you'd like more information on becoming a channel Membrio, you can hit the join button down below. Channel Membrios get access to all of my full-length live streams. I've been live streaming on Twitch and they are reposted there once they go away on Twitch. They have a bit more of a community. They get a better where you can see them commenting down below and special emojis that are little uteruses that are so cute. And don't forget to check out the wonderful sponsor of today's video, Anito Fertility Monitor. I'll see you next Monday.